So context is everything. But let me ask you a question first. Glass half empty or glass half full? And you've probably been asked that question before. In fact, you look like a sort of glass half full kind of guy. How about you? Well, this question is really a matter of perspective, isn't it? And what I want to ask you is about context. So let's reframe this question and say, is this enough water? What do you think? Is it enough? Enough for what? Well, let's help you out here. We're trudging through the desert, barren as far as you can see. Is this enough water? Probably not. And we're still trudging through the desert, and I turn around to you and say, hey, we have lots and lots of water. I have all these canteens. Is it enough water now? What do you think? The amount of water stayed the same, didn't it? But what changed? Well, the context changed, didn't it? So let's explore this idea of concept or context. So context means without the surrounding words or knowledge, so not to be fully understandable. So when I asked you if this glass of water was enough, you didn't have enough context, did you, to give me a fair answer? Let me introduce you to five or six, actually, six blind people. And each one of them was asked to describe what they felt. Oh, that's easy, said the one man who's got the elephant's trunk. This is a snake. And the guy who's got the elephant's tusk turns around and says, it's not a snake, it's a spear. And the man who's sitting on top of the elephant's head, playing with the ear, says, you know what, this is a fan. And the man who's on top of the step stool and can reach as far to the left and far to the right as he can says, you know what, this is a wall. And the woman who has her hands around the base of the elephant's leg turns around and says, tree trunk, that's what this is, it's a tree trunk. And lastly, the man who's looking at the tail says, you know what, it's a rope, wee it's a rope. And although each were partially right, they were in fact all wrong. Not one of them saw an elephant. And nowhere is this more prevalent than in medicine. Medicine, with its triumphs and advantages, has had to silo and specialize and subspecialize to such an extent that your primary care physician has become nothing more than a gatekeeper for specialities. And when he does that, he's out of context. And much like the blind men, even though he may be partially correct, he risks being totally wrong. Hi, my name is Kerry. I come from London, England, and I am not a physician. I'm an Ayurveda practitioner. I balance people's health through diet, lifestyle, and herbs. And I look at the root cause or the imbalance of what's going on. I don't use expensive equipment and I don't run lab tests. I work in the arena of imbalance. But unfortunately, in today's world, we operate, modern medicine operates in the top 10% of the iceberg, which is diseases and symptoms. And yet below that iceberg is, or below that water is 90% of where the imbalance lies. And that imbalance can be a metabolic imbalance, a physical imbalance, an emotional imbalance, or a spiritual imbalance. And when we don't take care of the imbalance, we run the risk of not taking care of the root problem. Let me introduce you to Bob. Hi, I'm Bob. Bob wakes up every single morning with a headache, and he goes to the doctor and he says, hey doc, you know, I'm just feeling terrible. I have a headache every single morning. You've got to help me. And the doctor turns around and says, you know what? Here's what I want you to do. Go and take some pain relievers and come back and see me in a week's time. If you still have problems, then we'll send you to a specialist. Now I want to introduce you to Tom. Tom also wakes up every single morning with a headache. 
And Tom turns around to the doctor and says, you know, doc, I get this headache every single morning. You have to help me. And the doctor says, huh, seems to be going around. I tell you what, take these pain relievers. If they don't work in about a week's time, come back and see me, and we'll give you some tests. If I was to tell you that Bob drinks a bottle of wine every single night, you'd be like, well, no wonder he gets a headache. And if I was to tell you that Tom gets hit over the head with a bottle of wine every single night, you'd be like, well, that kind of makes sense too, doesn't it? But the physician, not understanding the root cause, treats him the exact same way. Let's have a look at how Ayurveda does, does it different. Ayurveda, a 5,000-year-old system of medicine, is as relevant today as it was 5,000 years ago because Ayurveda looks at the whole body, body, mind, and the spiritual body too. And Ayurveda recognizes that there is no one size fits all. There is no one drug that suits all people. There is no one lifestyle that suits all people, and there is no one nutritional program that suits all people. Ayurveda says we have to work with the imbalance because if we don't sort out the imbalance, well, we often get a wake-up call, don't we? And for some, that wake-up call is an illness. You know, when the body just throws in the towel and says, I can't do this anymore. Anna's body threw in the towel. You would have loved Anna. She was six foot tall. She had a great big smile, a big heart, and she lit up a room. And I remember looking at an exit sign. In fact, I was looking at the door below the exit sign and thinking, I would love to escape through that door. Because if I can escape through that door, I can avoid this awful reality right now that Anna is being diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. And as the physician was telling her that there was no chemotherapy, no radiation therapy, no immunotherapy, and no clinical trials for her, I thought back over Anna's life and I thought that there had been signs and symptoms that things were wrong. I remember the time she had back pain and they gave her anti-inflammatories. And I remember the time that her legs all swelled up and they sent her to an endocrinologist. And there was that time that she was constantly nauseous and they sent her to a gastroenterologist who did a barrage of tests. And lastly, she lost all that weight and nobody knew why and they sent her to a nutritionist who also suggested she was depressed and they ended up putting her on antidepressants. And each one of those physicians gave her the best care they could with the best of their knowledge and the best of their training. But each one of them was wrong. And maybe, just maybe, if there had been somebody like me who could have connected all those dots together, who could have put Anna's health back into context, maybe, just maybe, I'd be telling you a different story about my mother, Anna, today. It is far more important to understand the imbalances of the body and treat that imbalance, the name, the disease, and find the pill for the ill. And yet, that's exactly what we do, isn't it? And you know what really pisses me off? Is way back at the beginning of the century, Thomas Edison said that the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the frame, in digestion, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And if we knew this way back at the beginning of the century, why is it today that 25% of our children are on medications? What kind of imbalance means that one in four children are doped up? Let me tell you about Ben. Ben was diagnosed with ADHD in second grade. That's not unusual to be diagnosed in second grade, is it? That's when the school system often picks this up. And Ben, well, they decided for Ben what they would do is they would put him on Ritalin. Well, unbeknown to the physicians at the time, Ben had an underlying tick disorder called Tourette syndrome. And what Ritalin did was it exacerbated these ticks. Now, they were, these weren't just like little ticks here and there. These were pretty profound vocal ticks. 
that happened during the school day. You can imagine what those second graders did with Ben. So Ben's having a hard time in school, so the physicians then decide that they better give him something to suppress the tick. So they go ahead and do that, something that suppresses the central nervous system. They also realize that Ben is depressed. After all, these second graders are teasing him, so they give him an antidepressant. Well, Ben can't sleep at night. After all, he has ADHD. So then they give him a sleep medication. So Ben's on these major medications from the age of seven to the age of 14. And at 14 years of age, he has his first psychotic break. I got told he was lying underneath his bed in fetal position, yelling, Mom, it's the meds. Mom, it's the meds. His mom took him off the meds. It took her two years. And this was many years ago now. Ben still has ADHD. And he won't even touch a multivitamin. And it's not just our children we over-medicate, is it? Let's have a look at this problem. Insomnia. 48% of Americans cannot sleep. What kind of imbalance means that half our population can't sleep? Look to the person next to you. It's either you or them that's not sleeping tonight. And yet we know that sleep is essential for health and well-being. There is a myriad of drugs and supplements to support this problem, isn't there? The Journal of the American Medical Association reported on a study where they took a group of insomniacs and half that group they gave meditation and yoga type exercises to. The other half they gave sleep education Things like, you know, not going to sleep with your TV on, and sleep medication. At the end of six weeks, the group that was on the meditation and yoga type exercises reported more sleep, better quality sleep, less fatigue, and less depression, more than the group that was on education and sleep medication. Clearly, we need to treat more than just the physical body. Imagine, if you will, the doctor of the future. You go to the doctor and you say, hey doc, I'm not feeling very well and I just don't know why. And the doctor turns around to you and says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to meditate 20 minutes twice a day, exercise 30 minutes a day, eat more organic fruits and vegetables, come off all that processed food, get out into nature more, oh, stop worrying about what you can't control, oh, and uh, ditch that TV. Come back and see me in three weeks. Can you imagine the benefits of seeing a doctor that understands that time in nature is what calms the central nervous system, that understands that eating right and in season balances our digestion, that understands too much visual stimulation hypersensitizes our children, and understands that stillness in every day is what calms and rejuvenates us? Can you imagine this kind of doctor? Medicine with his wonderful attributes, with its advanced technology, its life-saving pharmaceuticals, and its really skilled surgeons, has failed in its core promise to keep us well. I am here to start a revolution, a health revolution that I believe in, and the time is now. We have reached a tipping point moment in our health, and it's time to change. It's time to change our way of thinking. It's time to change how we put health back into context. It's time to change how we give a pill for every ill. And it's time to change how we specialize and subspecialize and subspecialize to the point that we no longer know who that whole person is. And it's Ayurveda that can show us how. Ayurveda is not only relevant to today, but is poised to be the medicine of the future. Ayurveda with its ability to look at the underlying imbalance. Ayurveda with its ability to look at what makes you unique. Maybe the reason for Ayurveda's success, past, present, and future, maybe its very definition of health, where it defines health as a well-balanced mind, a well-formed body, good elimination, 
where the metabolic types or doshas are in balance and when the mind and body are in harmony and only then is optimal health achieved. Clearly, we need to change our context because after all, medicine is not one size fits all and that's an idea worth spreading. Thank you.